right. Let's hope everyone has been having a blessed week. Hope you've had a good day so far. And praise God for allowing those of you who came out tonight to come and share with us in this Bible study. And grateful to those who are joining us over the live feed. <clears throat> and those who will view the recording later. Thank God for for all of you. Thank God for instilling a, a desire and a will to, to study the Word of God. I, I, it's no secret how important it is to study, to rightly divide, being a workman, not a shame, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. It's, uh, it's necessary for our growth, our maturation, but we need to know what God said as well. Amen? Amen. 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 Um, turn, as we continue our, our, our series study in the book of Lamentations, turn to Lamentations chapter 4. We're going to pick up on verse 4. We're going to pick up on verse 4. Let us, let us first pray and, and ask and invoke the presence of the Holy Spirit to just dwell among us tonight and speak to our hearts. Gracious and all-wise God, Lord, how we love you, how we thank you, how we honor, and how we adore your holy and righteous name. Thank you for being God. Thank you for being merciful. We thank you for your grace and your love. We thank you, Lord, how you have kept us all week long, how you've kept our homes, how you've kept our children, how you've kept us when we were in our jobs and when we were in our schools and away from our homes and allowed us to return and find things the way we left it. We thank you, O oh God. We thank you now for allowing us to come into your house of worship and rightly divide the word of truth one more time. We thank you for this setting. We thank you for this series of study that you have allowed us to embark upon, Lord. It has been food for the soul. Mm -hmm. We thank you, Lord, for how you have brought us through it and how you have shown thyself and thy will. And at the same time, reveal some things about us. We just pray now, O oh God, that you will see fit to allow your Holy Spirit to fall fresh among us this evening. Speak to our hearts, speak into our circumstances. Help us to see ourselves a little bit more. Continue to peel back layers, O oh God, that we may step out and be what you have called us to be, and that is your church and your people. We love you now, and we give you glory for what our ears are about to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So. Lamentations chapter 4, and beginning, we're going to pick up where we left off right at about verse 4. Spoke a little bit last week uh, and finished up chapter 3 and got into the intro parts of chapter 4. <clears throat> and spoke a little bit about those and spoke about how people ended up turning and being for themselves, how mothers didn't have anything to feed their children. Um, talked about how how tough and marred and tarnished and tarnished the people of God had become um, as if they had become something else other than what they were called to be and called for their use. So now, in as we get into verse four, Jeremiah begins once again to kind of hone in and and really hit home in describing the seriousness of the famine that they were going through, that the church was going through, um, how disheartening it was, how devastating it was, um, how troublesome it was. Um, he gives us some distinct description, I feel like, um, that I'm, I'm, I'm trusting that the Lord will um, speak to us spiritually through this text today. Um, let's, let's pick up and read some of that, beginning at verse 4. Beginning at verse 4. And of course, again, I'm reading from the new, uh, from the Christian Standard Translation. It says, The nursing baby's tongue clings to the root of his mouth from thirst. Infants beg for food, but no one gives them any. Those who used to eat delicacies are destitute in the streets. 
those who were reared in purple garments, huddle in trash heaps. The punishment of my dear people is greater than that of Sodom, which was overthrown in an instant without a hand laid on it. Her dignitaries, some of your translations say the Nazarites, her dignitaries were brighter than snow, whiter than milk. Their bodies were more ruddy than coral. Their appearance like lapis and lazul. Now they appear darker than soot. They are not recognized in the streets. Their skin has shriveled on their bones. It has become dry like wood. Those slain by the sword are better off than those slain by hunger who waste away, pierced with pain because the fields lack produce. Beloved, I, I want you to see in the text tonight what happens, what happens to the church when God allows the house to fall? When God allows the house to fall to the world. When God allows his children to fall to the world. Jeremiah gives us a description. Of what she will become. He gives us a description of what she will become. And looking at verse four, he says infants and uh, I mean, he said the nursing baby's tongue clings to the roof and then infants beg for food. And talking about the nursing baby's tongue, of course, you know, still talking about a, uh, a, a, nurse, a, a child that's still suckling from its mother's pats and, and there is nothing for the child. There's nothing for the child because there's no mother for them to cling to. The mothers had left. They gave us that. He told us that already in the previous verses. And then he's talking about the infants when he's talking about preschool to primary age, that nice three, four-year-old, three, four, five-year-old, if you will, begging for food, nourishment, yet no one gives them anything. No one gives them anything. There's no one around to give them anything. In the King James in that verse, it actually says, the young children ask bread and no man break it unto them kind of like the King James rendition of that verse a little better, the translation, um, because it, 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 it allowed my mind to think in a spiritual sense when it comes to the church, because it's, it, it, it pictures a scarcity, a scarcity of food, a scarcity of nourishment, of good food. And I declare, beloved, that there's been a scarcity of good food for a long time. There's been a scarcity of good food, good nourishment in the church for a long time. And that scarcity has caused the spirit man to starve. It has caused the spirit man to starve. And what, it is, and what has happened as a result is it's caused a lot of babies to grow physically into adults, but spiritually, they still need milk. Spiritually, they still need, they still need milk. In other words, you got folk who have been in the church for decades, but have not grown spiritually from the time they were first baptized. We see it all too well. We see it all too often. They haven't even made it to infancy stage where they can at least ask for what they need because they're still at the stage where they don't even know what they need. Beloved, you know how many folk are sitting up in churches and they don't even know that what they're being told is heresies. They don't even know that what they're being told is lies and fables. They don't even know that what they're being told or what they're practicing cannot be found anywhere in scripture. 
or that the scriptures are being twisted and turned for the preachers to say what they wanted to say. They don't even know. Why? Because they babies. Babies don't know what they need. They don't know what they need. All they know is where to get what they get. Whatever's given to them is what's given to them. They don't know what they actually need. And see, and then a child, a child at least got, you know, some sense to ask for what they need, but they ain't got the ability to get what they need on their own. But when you're talking about someone who has never grown up from babies, Paul talked about you still being on milk. Paul talked about how we need to be moving on to other things beyond the death, the burial, and the resurrection. But, but we can't because you're still on milk. He talked about these things to the Corinthian church. And I mean, I, it's disheartening. And, 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 and Jeremiah gets into really where the blame lies. He gets into really where the blame lies really when we get around to verse uh, verse 18, thir I mean 13 or so. He talks about it a little bit. And you'll see what I'm talking about. But it, it, it really is a sad case to see when I look at the church and we still, and we see a, a, a body of people. You know, I, I remember telling my leadership class, when we were doing our leadership seminar, and I remember telling them, the church is full of babies and devils. I wasn't just talking about greatest empty. I was talking, I'm talking about the body of Christ. It's full of babies. Or, or, I don't want to say the true body of Christ, but the visible body of Christ, the visible church, those who go to church, okay, the people see, is full of babies and devils. Those who have grown up, those are the ones you see in Bible study, those are the ones that make up your Sunday school, they're your tithers, and they are your workers. The rest of them, babies and devils. That's the truth. It's a sad truth, but it's the truth. And don't sit up here and think the devil don't go to church. He's there every time the doors are open. You better believe it. Okay? The devil goes to church. He wants to show up. Who else you think is robbing you of your seed? Who else you think is there to try to disrupt your spirit so you can't worship or receive what thus saith the Lord? That don't just happen by osmosis or by accident. He's there intentionally to do that. He's there intentionally to do that. And then the others are babies who have not even started cutting teeth. They're babies and they don't know what they need. They don't know what's good food. They don't know what to look for. And they'll take whatever tastes good. Whatever sounds good. Like goats. Goats eat anything. Eat anything. Yeah. They look for the sweets and the dainties. The text says the food was so scarce there was no one to break it unto them. What does that tell us? For whatever reason, preachers stop preaching good food. Preachers stop preaching good food. And I had to ask myself the question, why? What made preachers so smart to where they thought because of their intelligence, they should teach something other than the word of God. That's right. What made Paul said, I claim to know nothing. And Paul was a scholar. And he said, I know nothing but Christ crucified. 
He said, if I preach any other gospel than the gospel that I've told you about, it ain't a gospel at all. He said, don't even listen to me. But we've gotten so smart. Preachers in the pulpit have gotten so smart and they're so intellectual and so philosophical and they want to make you feel so good and they want to pad pews and pad pockets that they just want to do whatever's necessary to tickle your ears. And because you're babies, we can gobble it up. We gobble it up. See, when food gets scarce, the spirit man starves. The spirit can't digest that crap. Okay? The spirit man can't digest that crap. He ain't even eating it. Because spirit recognizes spirit. And the word of God is spirit. So if it is anything other than the word of God that's going forward, he's not eating anything. He's like, when, when are you going to serve me up something? All we get is gravy and cherries on top and whipped cream. When, when am I going to get something? But we keep going back. Why? Because it sounds good to me, though. But I'm not growing. And how do you know you're not growing? The Lord shows you evidence every time that you're not growing. Why are you still so quick to fly off the handle? Because you ain't grown. Why you still talk the way you talk? Because you ain't grown up at all. Why are you so easily offended? Why are you so easily depressed? Why are you so envious of your neighbor? Why do you covet your neighbor's wife? Why you still got whorish ways? Why you don't feel bad by the way you live it? Because you're still a baby. That's what happens to the people of God when the food becomes scarce. And we've been living in a time where the people of God have been under a famine for decades. We know that there were still some good preachers around. There was Jeremiah was there. There were still some good preachers around who were still teaching and preaching the truth of God. But you know, you know, it, you can't have one preacher trying to pastor five hundred thousand sheep. Yeah, a preacher can preach the five hundred thousand, but he can't pass the five hundred thousand. Can't do that. A pastor got that many sheep, he don't know his sheep. And you know what? The sheep don't know they pastor. He ain't your pastor because he preach every Sunday. He your pastor because he visits your sick. Because he buries your dead. Because he marries off your children. Because he prays for you when you need it. That's what makes him your pastor. Anybody, you can get anybody to come up here and preach Sunday after Sunday. Yeah. The food has become scarce. That's why when good food goes forward, it's just like little babies, little children. They just scoot around the vegetables. See, I ate them. They just scooted them around the plate. But I ate them, mama. Boy, you just spread it in mouth. You didn't eat that. <laughs> we, we, we don't want the nourishment when we're young like that. Why? Because that nourishment don't always taste good. It's good for you, but it don't always taste good. It don't always go down as smooth. You need that spoonful of honey to go with it. That's why, you know, that's why the Lord told them, comfort ye my people. Isaiah said, comfort ye my people. Okay, tell them what I said, but at the same time, comfort them. Okay, give them a spoonful of honey to go with it. You got to cut them, but at the same time, you got to give them a little ointment with it. You can't just leave them cut and bleed. Cut them, but tell them you love them at the same time. <laughs> 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 I 
It don't go down that easy. Child don't know no better. Mama makes you sit there at the table until you eat them green beans because she knows what's best for you. Good food has become scarce. Good food has become scarce. That's what he told them. Your baby's roots are clinging to their mouth, to the roof of their mouth. Infants are begging for food and there's nobody to give it to them. I just want to know where are the preachers who are bold enough to stand on the word of God, to stand on the truth of God's word and preach it unapologetically without worrying about the backlash, who can preach sin without worrying about their name being drugged through social media. Or in the, in the news or whatever it might be. Who ain't afraid of somebody leaving a church congregation to go to the church next around uh, around the corner. Because they didn't like what the pastor had to say. Where are those preachers at? They're very few and far between. And in between each of them are starving children. Starving sheep. They're starving. Look what he went on to say in verse 5. Those who used to eat delicacies are destitute in the streets. Those who were reared in purple garments huddle in trash cans. He's talking about those who were he ain't talking about the children now. He ain't talking about the kids. He's talking about those who are grown. He's talking about grown sheep now. They grown and they were privileged. Privileged to be raised on good meat and potatoes. You know, and they were from good homes and prestigious families. But when the food is gone, They'll eat anything. When the food is gone, they'll eat anything. And they'll settle for anything. How many times have you seen a, someone who may have been a longtime member of a church body? You know, may have been there 20, 30 years. Might have even grown up in the church. <clears throat> or an old deacon that's been there for 20, been on the deacon board 25 years. And they grew up under a powerful, God-fearing pastor. Who not only pastored the people, but preached and taught the word of God. And then came in a hireling. And even though the new preacher pastor ain't giving them anything, they still refuse to leave or they still refuse to stand up and say something. They sit there and just take whatever they're being given. And then the next thing you know, they get used to it. I've seen it all the time. They ain't going nowhere. Why? Because this is my home. This is my church. Ain't nobody, I ain't leaving my church. Okay, well, just say something. Okay, don't leave, but say something. You a deacon. You won't say nothing. You won't call a meeting among the deacon body. You a member. You won't say something to the deacons. Say something if you're not willing to leave. Or if not, just leave. And go where you know you can be fed. Because the thing is, you've had good food. You've been fed truth. So how can you be sit there and be fed slop? Or not be fed at all? How can you do it? And the thing is, 
is when you do it, guess who else you teach to do it? Your children. Others who are watching you. Others who have looked up to you in that body or in that congregation, they see you stay put, so what they do? They stay put. They see you starving spiritually, so they continue to starve spiritually. Next thing you know, what does it say they're doing? They eating anything. Look at what it said. They huddle in trash heaps. King James says dung hills. Not only are they scraping through it looking for trash, but they are even lying in it. Meaning they'll hang around in it. They'll stay in it. Knowing, knowing it's not anything good for them. And they still stay right there. Going through the trash, looking for anything. Gobbling up anything. Beloved, this is where the church, the church is right there right now. People gobble up anything because they starve. They don't know what's good and what ain't. They just starve because they look around and there's nobody serving up nourishment. There's nobody serving up good food. Look at verse 6. The punishment of my dear people is greater than that of Sodom, which was overthrown in an instant without a hand laid on it. Now, take note that what Jeremiah was doing here is he was not comparing the sins of Sodom versus the sins of the people of Israel, of God's people. He wasn't comparing the sin. He was comparing the judgment. He was comparing the punishment, not the sin. Look where he says. He stated, he stated it in such a way that the people of God might perceive that they were worse than the Sodomites. He worded it in such a way, because he said, the punishment of my people is greater than that of Sodom. I mean, come on. We're human. What are you initially, you know, because you're like, well, the punishment must fit the crime. Right? That, that logically makes sense to me, right? So, so we initially, uh, uh, our minds go, well, we must have sinned greater than Sodom did. Is that what you're saying, Jeremiah? That we sin greater than Sodom? Because our punishment was, you're saying our punishment was more severe? What he's showing them is that it wasn't about the, what he, he wasn't showing them the sin, he was showing them the difference in the judgment. The difference in the judgment. Because the thing is, God's judgment against his church it wasn't as swift. It lingered for a while. His hand came on Sodom and wiped it out in a day. It was swift. His hand came on his people. And he went, they went through famine, pestilence. They went through exile. In captivity, they went through uh, ruin because some of them had the, some of the common folk got left behind to just reside in the city that was nothing but rubble. Couldn't even grow food from the soil. Some of them got left there and just left to just try to survive, eating each other, eating their young doing whatever they could do. And it lasted for years. Those that went in exile didn't come out for 70 years. It lingered for a while. 
Because, you know, the thing is, for God and his judgment on his people, it was very meticulous and methodical in his approach for a specific purpose to bring out a specific outcome. See, the thing is, you got to understand, the people of Sodom were not the people of God. The people of Sodom and how God dealt with Sodom is how God is going to deal with the unbelievers. And he's showing them that the wages of sin is death. So he could easily get that message across and instill the right fear just by wiping them out in an instant. Think about that. You see God wipe out an entire city in an instant. Whew, wait a minute. That's going to instill some fear. But the thing is, when he started dealing with his church, it wasn't about punishment for sin. It was about disobedience. And we got to understand that, you know, just sin, plain old normal sin and disobedience is two different things. Sin is consciously doing wrong, you know, without knowing that it's really wrong. But disobedience is, constant, is consciously doing wrong when you know better. So consciously doing wrong when you don't know better and consciously doing wrong when you know better. That's disobedience. See, that was the thing when you was a child, you did something. Mama told you don't do that no more. It's when you disobeyed when you got punished. That's right. So the punishment was different. See, we all, don't you know that, that, that the unbelievers, that the unrighteous don't even stand in the same judgment as the people of God? They don't stand in the same judgment we stand in here. Because God is going to judge us on what we did with our gifts and what we did with what he has entrusted us with. He ain't judging us on whether we're going to heaven or hell. I don't know about y'all, but I'm saved. I'm, when I leave here, I'm going to glory. After from the body, I'm going to be with the Lord. Yeah. I, I, I ain't no more pain or suffering for me when I leave this way, this side, I, I ain't thinking about no suffering. But, but see, for these folk, when God take them out of here, they got an eternity of suffering. So it don't even matter how much they suffer on this side. Why, why does that matter? God ain't got to deal with them now because they're going to get dealt with. But for us, oh, God got to deal with you right now. Let me deal with you right now because why? Because, it, you know, your, your time ain't came up yet. And I got some work for you to do while you're still here. So let me deal with you now. Get you straight so I can use you to fulfill my purpose in you before I call you on home. So he can't just leave you like you was or like he found you when he saved you. No, he's got some work for you to do. He got some things for you to accomplish for his kingdom and his purpose. So he has to grow you up. That means he's got to take you through trial. He got to take you through chastisement. He got to take you through growing pains. He got to put you in the fire. He's got to shape you and make you and mold you. He has to do all of these things to you to bring you to an expected end. Are y'all getting what I'm saying? So he was pointing out to them the difference in the judgment. He's pointing out the difference in the judgment. There's a difference. Beloved, look at verse 7. Yeah. For those are some slow strokes. They said the hand didn't even lay long. It didn't even barely even touch Sodom. It was slow strokes on his people, though. Woo. It's almost like mama hit you, didn't thought about it. And then she hit you again. Yeah, thought about it. 
and then talk to you a little bit, then hit you again. This is slow. He just hit me five times and be done. And then afterwards, you take your phone and take all your privileges and you can't go nowhere for two weeks or a month. It's a slow punishment. God's hand was slow on Israel. They laid on him long. Beloved, God's hand has been on us for quite a while. For quite a while. But right now, we really feel it. We really feel it. In verse 7, her dignitaries, her Nazarites, were brighter than snow, whiter than milk. Their bodies were more ruddy than coral. Their appearance like Lapis and Lazul. Understand that a Nazarite, I'm going to read verse 8 too. Now they appear darker than soot. They are not recognized in the streets. Their skin has shriveled on their bones. It has become dry like wood. Understand that a Nazarite, in the Hebrew, that word is nazir. Nazir. And it comes from the word nazar, which basically means to consecrate or to set apart, to abstain from impurities of the world. They abstain from strong drink and, and wine. They, 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 they wash themselves more often. They were very meticulous about their hair and how it was kept, whether or not it was cut or how it was groomed. They were very meticulous. They were, they were set apart. They were people who were holy in worship and how they worshiped God was kind of like it was on another level. In other words, when you saw one, you knew that was a Nazarite. They stood out. They were distinguished. They were set apart. And, and look at what it says happened to them. It magnified the state of God's church by showing that not even these people were able to escape God's judgment. Not even these were able to escape the effects of the fallout of God's church. What does that mean? What does that tell us? It tells us, I, I don't care how saved you are. I don't, I don't care how saved you are. I don't care if you don't drink. I don't care if you don't smoke. I don't care that you don't cuss. I don't care that you don't listen to secular music. I don't care that you're in the church every time the doors are open. I don't care if you're a monk. And you have set yourself apart from, or are you in Amish and you don't you don't do anything that is worldly? You don't even watch TV because it's the devil. I don't even I don't care how saved you are. No one in the church could escape the effects of God's hand on her. No one could. Everyone felt it to the point where God said, the, Jeremiah said. That God changed their appearance to where they were no longer even recognizable as Nazarites. And you would think from what a Nazarite is, surely they didn't deserve all this. They, they, they were good, upstanding people. They, they kept the law of God. They worshiped according to the law of God. But don't you know that the worship of Israel before during this time was no longer even pleasing to God? The worship wasn't even pleasing to God anymore. Their sacrifices were no longer even pleasing to God. Why do you think God didn't have feel any kind of way about knocking everything down? Who cares what you're sacrificing if your heart ain't in the right place? They were no longer even recognizable. Kind of makes you wonder. Do people recognize the church when they see the church? Or do they only recognize the church when they're at church? That's the question. 
Folk only recognize the church when we assemble as the church. But do they recognize the church when you're out there? Or has God made us undetectable? We look like everybody else. You know, I said it last week a little bit, but, you know, it just used to be different. It used to be different. How we even did worship used to be different. How we, how we dressed when we came to worship, it used to be different. People cared about it. It mattered what you had on. <laughs> it mattered. In the old, the old women of the church, you couldn't be a young girl not dressed properly in church and not hear it. That didn't fly. But now the young girl ready to cuss the mother of the church out if she got something to say. Either that or she won't come back. Beloved, it's just different. Worship is different. I told you worship now is entertainment. It is. It's entertainment. We want you to get your we want to get your hype and you know, I guess that's why we don't do devotion no more. There no such thing as praise team when I came up, when I was coming up. It wasn't that long ago. It was devotions. Deacon started service. Yeah. They led some hymns. They did the prayer. They read some scripture. Might have had a testimonial period. And then we went on forward into worship. It was something about those songs, too. There's something about them. That's why, in my, that's why in our Lord's Supper service, that's all we sing is hymns. That's why. There's something about those old songs. There's spirit in those songs. Why? Because they tell the truth on God. The songs tell the truth on God. Now, don't get me wrong. I like the praise team, too. I like them. Especially when they sing some good songs some, some, that tell the truth on God. I like them. But why did it change? What happened with that? What do you think was the motive behind them going from devotion to praise team? Devotion got too boring for people. Because <laughs> deacons got old. Yeah, they got old. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them young ones were just too lazy to come right. and do it. Deacons got old. The young deacons wasn't going to do it. Or they didn't know the hymns. Praise team. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I talked about it last week. Pastors don't wear robes no more. Pastors preaching in jeans and t-shirts. Jeans and t-shirts. Worship service is no longer worship service. It's a concert with a speech at the end. Y'all seen them services? It's a concert. When the lights are down here in the, in the audience and you got lights and spotlights going all over across the stage and you got five guitars and two drummers and it's loud, it's a concert and the people, you look at them, y'all ever seen them young kids? Mm -hmm. well, I don't even know what they call it. They, they, they don't even call it work. They call it something else. But they'll be out there and be thousands of them. And they just jumping around like they at the Motley Crue concert or something. That's not worship. It's not. That's entertainment. Yeah, it's entertainment. It's almost, you know, but it draws them. It, it draws them. And then the preacher gets up and he just makes them feel good. Send them home. Ooh, I'm going back there next week. That's what happens. And we do the same thing in the black church, too. That's what we're going to now, too. We're in the same thing. We're doing the same thing. Don't think it's just the white churches or the other, you know, the worship centers. No. Black churches are doing the same thing. We're doing the same thing. That's what we're coming to. No longer. Look, it's completely changing the appearance of God's people. Lastly, verse 9. Though slain by the sword, 
were better off than those slain by hunger who waste away pierced with pain because the fields lack of produce. Beloved, those that were slain who have succumbed are better off than those that remain, especially among the people of God. Especially among the people of God. Because we're left, we're left to withstand and take the full punishment of God. However long it may be, however long his hand may be on us, with every long stroke, we're left to take the full punishment. Starvation, you think about that. That's a heck of a way to go. Because that can take a long time. That can take a long time. Can you imagine going 40 days without eating? Go four hours. <laughs> <laughs> Just Linda says she can't go four hours. <laughs> but 40 days without food or without water. And even then, some of you, your body would still take you even longer beyond that. Imagine. Imagine. Beloved, the reason the church is in the state that she is in, it began, it began due to lack of good food. When the preaching became watered down, the sheep were no longer being fed. And when the sheep were no longer being fed, they began to be led astray. And they began to gobble up whatever they could get. It ain't that so many aren't saved in our churches. It's that so many are babies. That's the problem. It's always been my concern and my intent as your pastor is to feed you with sincere milk. To grow you spiritually. Not by numbers. I ain't worried about numbers. I don't care if it's just 10 of us. I'm going to preach and teach what thus saith the Lord. Amen. And whoever God allows me to pastor and to give me a given ear to hear. I'm going to tell what the Lord said. Because that's my charge. And it actually matters to me. Not because of you, but because I fear God. <laughs> okay. And I fear him enough to where I can't lie on him. I just can't do it. My spirit won't let me do it. So I got to tell you the truth, whether you like it or not. Whether you stay or whether you leave. It's not my business, or nor is it my problem. My job is to tell them. But I pray. I pray that the people of God, those who are his children, he would give an ear to hear. And I believe that. I believe that. Those who have truly been born again. No, you ain't going to leave. Just like you ain't leave your mama when she made you eat them peas. Y'all know I won't eat a pea today. I will not eat peas. I cannot stand peas because I had to eat so many peas. No, I love green, green beans. I'm yeah, fine green, with green no, beans. Cream, like he oh, cream beans. Like pe no kind of peas. I ain't eating nobody's peas. I hate it. I have to eat. But you know what? I ain't eat my mama because she made me eat them peas. Mm -hmm. When you know you're being fed good food, you want to know how you know it's good food? It's because when you need it later in life, the Lord will bring it back to you. That's how you know. It'll be something later that week. Mm -hmm. And you'll be like, ooh, the Lord said that on Sunday. Mm -hmm. He told me. Look at God. That's 
how you know you're being fed. That's how you know. When you start noticing the change, when things start to bother you in your life, that's how you know you're growing. If don't nothing ever bother you, find you a new pastor. Amen. Come back and see me next week. Um, beloved, most of us have heard about Sister Tawana Wynn Carrington. Lord, have mercy. With our hearts and our prayers go out to the Givens Wynn Carrington family. It's very soon, very close with Charlie's passing. Less than 30 days. Less than 30 days. Beloved, let us be praying for that family. Lift them before the Lord. Lift those girls, Kimber and Tree. Losing their mother. Tawana was just 53. Oh, <clears throat> she was just 53. She went into that hospital about 24 days before her passing. And her children couldn't go in to see her the whole time. Yeah. Not until the day of her passing. That's right. Was in that together, and yeah. we, he, she couldn't see him until he died. That's right. Yeah. So after it's, it's, died, it's rough. Y'all yeah. remember when, when the Lord took Sister Smith due to COVID? She died alone. Yeah. They wasn't letting nobody in the hospital then. That is so sad. Not anyone. Yeah. Beloved, it's, pray for this family. Pray for greater liberty. Yeah. Yeah. It's another one of ours. Yeah. That grew up in this body, has worked and served this church faithfully with her gifts, her talents, and her presence. Pray God is going to get us through all of this, you all. He is. He is. But God is still faithful. Yes. Yes, He is. God is still faithful. So we thank God for her. We're going to celebrate her life. On this coming Monday, this coming Monday, we'll be here at Greater Liberty. Um, visitation will be from 11 to 1. The services will begin at 1 o'clock. Um, we're going to celebrate her life. Thank God for her. Encourage and comfort the family as best we can. And love on them. Love on each other. <laughs> love on each other. Love on your family. You don't, You just don't know. Like that old UGK riding dirty song, one day you're here, and the next day you're gone. Don't try it like y'all ain't heard UGK. Y'all know I love some UGK. I'm a 90s kid. I told y'all, a 90s kid. Okay. That's the greatest rap album of all time. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> but yeah, one day you're here. I've never heard it. You're not a 90s kid, Miss Linda. You <laughs> Have you heard anything from Sister Pinky? I ended up going out of town. I didn't get a chance to touch base with her. She doing uh, well. Pray, pray for Sister Pinky as she continues she, to recover uh, from her eye surgery. Yeah, see, what did she? Um, um, yeah, she had eyes, but she didn't come to church Sunday because of that. Right, right. I figured she wouldn't. Think have. it's gonna take a while. She probably shouldn't even be driving anyway. Yeah, but let us continue to pray for her. Uh, continue to pray for Cam. Cam had another procedure this past week as well. He did. Um, he did. He he had uh, he had the port removed from his from his neck where it was in his chest where they put it back in his arm. Oh, okay. So he had to go get that removed. Also, also, I don't know if he he may or may not want me to tell it, but I'm gonna tell it anyway. Cam did get put back on the transplant list. Okay. Praise God. Praise God. So and he had a birthday today. And he had a birthday. That's right. 27. 20, 27. You're getting old. Our other child that the doctor told his mother that he was going to die. Praise he was going to die. So we pray that the, you know, the Lord move his name up swiftly up that list and uh, the Lord provide him with a, with a kidney. And uh, things go well with that. But that's, that is good news. Yeah. Praise God. To God be all glory. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Thank you for Brother Young, Brother Young, for standing for me on Sunday. Amen. Oh, my God. Amen. 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 I appreciate you, Doc. Yeah. Um, and um, again, let us be in prayer for this coming worship this Sunday and be in prayer for the homegoing service for Sister Joanna Carrington. Amen. 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 Also, Sunday school will be Sunday morning as well. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and all, all wise God, Lord, we thank you. We love you. We thank you for the word tonight. We thank you for how your spirit manifests itself. Thank you, Lord, for teaching. Thank you, thank you for the teaching of thy word, Lord. Thank you for giving us ears to hear. And now, Lord, we pray for a will to be obedient and a desire to apply these principles to our lives so we can please you, for you to be pleased with our service that we might be meet for the master's use. Keep us now. We want to lift up the family of Sister Tawana Wynn Carrington. We lift up her husband. We're praying for Willie, oh God. Be with him, oh Lord. Give him the comfort that he needs. We'll be praying for Kimber and for Tree and Sister Barbara. Lord, it's a lot on that family in such a short time. Lord, whatever purpose you have for having them go through this season, or all of us going through this season, I pray, Lord, that you can move swiftly. But, as, but Lord, I also ask that you relinquish your sword for just a little while. Allow some healing to take place. We love you, oh God, and we thank you, and we honor and we adore you. Keep us now till we meet again. Amen. 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 Yes, ma'am. I was going to ask you, uh, I was going to tell you to pray for my mom. My mother, I took her in today, so we having an uphill battle now. Mm -hmm. I can't get the uh, levels down. It's keep going up with the Coumadin, so uh, okay. it's like uh, I got to take her back every two weeks. It okay. was like a six to eight year period, yes, so I can't get the levels come back down. They keep going higher. Yes, ma'am. But she's a diabetic too. Yes, ma'am. So we're also praying for the mother of Sister Sheila Smith. Amen. 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 God bless you.